Number 1. Mark Hyambur Mark was last seen at approximately 4 p.m. near his family's home on Sunray Road in rural Delhaven, New Jersey on November 25, 1991. His mother allowed him to observe firefighters extinguishing a small brush fire a quarter of a mile from their house. Mark's mother left the residence to run an errand that would have normally taken five minutes. But due to traffic, she became delayed and as a result, she did not get home until 40 minutes had passed. Mark had disappeared by the time she returned home. His mother assumed that he was with neighborhood children at the time. Mark has not been seen since. He was reported missing by his mother at approximately 5 p.m. that evening. After several days of unsuccessful searches by foot, boat and plane, investigators came to the realization that they were dealing with an abduction. Investigators did locate Mark's left shoe at Sunray Beach approximately 75 yards from the family's home. His footprints were also seen above the tide line, but these were the only solid clues ever found. The afternoon of his disappearance, traffic was rerouted past his house. Mark was last seen by a park guard about 3.45 p.m. heading towards a local park with a girl about his age. Despite efforts from investigators, the girl has never been identified. She was about 9 or 10 years old in 1991 and had dishwater blonde hair. She was about 4 feet tall, weighed approximately 70 to 75 pounds and was wearing a 3 quarter length dark blue ski parka with a hunter orange stripe on the back. Authorities believe the girl could have important information about Mark's disappearance. Mark was also possibly sighted with two other males on the day of his disappearance. One is described as between 30 and 35 years old, about 5'8 to 5'9 tall and 150 pounds. He had a dark reddish brown hair in a ponytail and a generally scruffy unkept appearance. There is no sketch or description for the other man. Authorities said the sketch resembled Thomas Budkavage, a convicted sex offender who first became associated with the case in 1993. In 1993, a male prostitute approached the police and said Bud Cavage, one of his regular clients, had shown him a video of himself having sex with a young boy who resembled Mark. The boy was handcuffed, gagged and appeared frightened. The prostitute said he asked Thomas if it was Mark Heimbaugh, to which Thomas said it was. He apparently also said he deliberately planted Mark's sneakers on the beach to confuse the investigation. However, Bud Cavage was never charged in connection with Mark's disappearance. In 1993, he denied any involvement in the boy's disappearance. Authorities have issued a photograph showing what the now 35-year-old Mark might look like and publicly released a 2010 phone call by a man who described himself as the son of the witness of the crime made from a payphone in the Port Richmond area of Philadelphia. The caller in the edited call to the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children said Gilbert Patrick Mary was involved in the boy's disappearance. However, investigators have come up empty locating a person by that name, but are asking for the public's help to identify the voice. Flyers were also handed out in the Philadelphia neighborhood, but so far, nothing has come out of it. Mark still remains missing. Number 2. Britney Beers On September 16, 1997, at about 8.30 p.m., Britney Beers and her brother were outside riding bikes in an apartment parking lot at Village Manor Apartment in Sturgis, Michigan. Britney's mother, Tina Stetler, went to get groceries for supper while her brother went with his friends across the street to get candy. A witness later told police he had seen Britney talking with her man in a red or brown mid-size car shortly before the time of her disappearance. Brittany walked over to the witness and told him that she, quote, made a new friend. Tina returned home at 9.5 p.m. and asked Brittany's brother to find her. When Brittany could not be located, the authorities were called. Police found Brittany's bicycle abandoned shortly after she was seen. She has not been seen since. 
Sketches of the unidentified man seen speaking to Brittany were distributed through the area in the days following her disappearance. He is described as being in his late 20s or 30s, has short, dark hair and a thick moustache. He was driving either a mid-sized red car or a brown Renault. Even though the man is not considered a suspect, authorities are looking for the man to question him. In 1998, a year after Britney's disappearance, Michigan court removed Britney's younger sister and older brother from the family home after allegations of child physical and sexual abuse were issued in which Britney's father, Raymond Beers, Raymond's brother, James Beers, and Kevin Folsom, the father of one of Britney's half-brothers, were allegedly involved in it. Kevin Folsom was incarcerated for molesting Britney but was released in 2008. Her case received more publicity in 2000 after the arrest of Michigan man who had images of child pornography saved on his computer. One of the victims resembled Britney but was later determined not to be the missing girl. She was last seen wearing a white tank top or a t-shirt with a floral design on it, pink tie dyed shorts and white sneakers with a pink design on the edges with shoelaces that had red stripe down the center. She was missing four upper baby teeth at the time of her disappearance. Brittany's case remains open and unsolved. Number 3. Sabrina Eisenberg At 6 p.m. on November 24, 1997, Marlene Eisenberg woke up and went into her kitchen. She was surprised to find the laundry room door to the garage was open. She then discovered that her five-month-old daughter, Sabrina, was missing from her crib. A handmade blue and yellow blanket with imprinted animal images and yellow piping was also missing from her crib. Investigators learned that the Eisenberg had left their garage door open overnight. The interior door may have also been left unlocked. They also found an unidentified blonde hair and a shoe print near the baby's crib, as well as seven unidentified fingerprints inside the house. Neighbors told authorities there had been several incidents involving possible attempted break-ins in the area in homes with small children. One of the Eisenberg's neighbors reported that his dog barked at approximately 1 a.m. on the morning Sabrina vanished. After letting the dog outside, the man believed he heard a baby crying somewhere in the distance. He stated that none of his closest neighbors had small children at the time. It is not known if the cries the witness thought he overheard were from Sabrina. Authorities questioned why no one inside the Eisenberg's residence awoke if an intruder indeed abducted Sabrina. The family owned the dog and they stated that the pet never barked during the night Sabrina disappeared. Suspicion began to fall on Marlene and her husband Steve. There were suspicions because there were no apparent signs of forced entry and no ransom demands. They became even more suspicious after the parents' press conference and a video of Marlene smiling. They also were suspicious of a video of Sabrina a few days before she vanished. To some investigators, it appeared that she had bruises on her face and a patch of hair missing from her head. In order to prove their innocence, the parents agreed on taking polygraphs. Marlene claimed that the police told her that the results were inconclusive. However, the sheriff's office has stated that her results were not inconclusive. They didn't publicly state whether she passed or failed. Shortly after Sabrina vanished, the Eisenbergs hired an attorney. They felt that they had no choice since they were being considered suspects. The police have declined to comment on any possible evidence in the case. They claim that Eisenberg have not been very cooperative in the case. Police have not ruled them out as suspects, but they continue to maintain their innocence in the disappearance of Sabrina. In November of 1999, Steve and Marlene Eisenberg were arrested and charged with conspiracy lying to investigators and giving false information about the disappearance of their daughter. Investigators claimed that they have recorded conversations between the couple, with Marlene saying, The baby is dead and buried. It was found dead because you did it. The baby is dead no matter what you say. You just did it. 
Steven apparently replied, I wish I hadn't harmed her. They don't know the truth, right? However, in February 2001, a judge found that the investigators lied when seeking permission to place the wire traps in Eisenberg's residence. Steve and Marlene were cleared of all charges against them. The judge also stated that there was nothing on the tapes which contained the evidence mentioned in the transcripts of the Eisenberg's conversations. The lead prosecutor in the case was demoted in July 2001. Steve and Marlene's attorneys filed motions seeking for the government to repay their clients' legal fees in August 2001, given that the charges had been dropped. They received $2.7 to $2.9 million in damages. The amount was later reduced to $1.3 to $1.4 million. In April 2003, police began to suspect that an unidentified young girl known as Paloma Unknown, who was abandoned in Mexico five years earlier and being raised in Illinois, was Sabrina. DNA testing, however, confirmed that they were not the same person. Paloma remains unidentified and Sabrina remained missing. However, in 2017, a woman contacted the Eisenberg through Facebook, believing that she might be Sabrina. She said she could not find no records or photos to document the first five months of her own life, and she apparently bears a resemblance to the Eisenberg's two other children. DNA testing is currently being done by a private lab to determine if she is the missing child. No results have been released yet. Number 4. Tabith Daniel Tudors On the morning of April 29, 2003, 13-year-old Tabitha left her Nashville home to walk to the school bus stop. Witnesses saw her walking in that direction. She was reading some papers as she walked and didn't appear to be in a hurry or looking for anyone. Tabitha did not get on the bus and never arrived at Bailey Middle School two miles away. Her parents contacted the school that evening when she failed to return home. When they found out she had been absent for the school that day, they reported her missing shortly before 6 p.m. A neighborhood boy claimed Tabitha was walking down the hill as a red car pulled up beside her about halfway down the hill. The young witness said Tabitha got into the car, at which point the driver, a black male wearing a baseball cap, turned around and headed back up the hill. The boy's story has not been confirmed and some investigators doubt his credibility. Search dogs were brought in. They tracked the route that Tabitha took every day to the bus stop. But 30 or so yards from the bus stop, the dogs reversed course and headed up the hill. The dogs tracked Tabitha's scent to a nearby alley, a place her friends say she never went on her own. The former boyfriend of Tabitha's sister matches the description of the driver. He drove a red car and he knew where and when Tabitha took the bus to school each morning. But the police have never been able to connect him to her disappearance. Her parents stated they did not believe Tabitha would have willingly gone into a car with anyone other than a family member. Police did not believe this was a runaway case since all of Tabitha's possessions are accounted for, including her makeup, clothes, and a $20 bill she had been given previous Sunday at church. Tabitha's room did provide one clue. Police discovered a note in her handwriting, TDT and MTL. Tabitha's full name is Tabitha Daniel Tudors. Police are looking for MTL. Her parents and two adult siblings were all investigated, but none are being called suspects in her disappearance. A man named Martin Tim Boyd, who was arrested for trying to lure an 11-year-old girl into his car four months after Tabitha's disappearance, was looked at as a person of interest in her case. Because of the nature of the crime he was charged with and because the alleged incident happened just a few blocks from Tabitha's home. However, there is no evidence connecting Boyd and Tabitha, and he was eventually taken off the suspect list. On October 30, 2003, a trucker reported a possible sighting of Tabitha from Linton, Indiana. 
the trucker saw a girl accompanied by a man and another teenage girl. The girl, who looked like Tabitha, appeared to be anxious and afraid. Later, when he saw missing person's flyer of Tabitha, he realized that she resembled the girl he had seen and contacted the police. A hotel clerk in Linton also saw a girl resembling Tabitha with a man and a teenage girl and reported it, but these sightings has not been confirmed. On August 19, 2003, almost five months after Tabitha's disappearance, an 11-year-old girl named Heaven Ross disappeared while on her way to school in Northport, Alabama. Three years after she went missing, Heaven's remains were found in Holt, Alabama, and her murder remains unsolved. Just like Tabitha, Heaven had light-colored hair and disappeared in the morning hours on the way to school. The authorities are considering a possible connection between the girls' cases, though the distance between Nashville and Northport is great, and so far, no evidence has been uncovered to link the two cases. Tabitha's case remains unsolved. Number 5. Paul Franchak Paul Franchak was born on April 27, 1964, to Chester and Dora Franchak in a Chicago, Illinois hospital. When he was 36 hours old, a woman entered his mother's hospital room wearing a white nurse's uniform and told Dora that the physician needed to see the infant and left with the child. Twenty minutes later, hospital staff discovered that none of their staff had the child and that he was the victim of a kidnapping. At 2 p.m., the police were called after a search of the hospital turned up no sign of him. Investigators determined that the abductor took Paul down a back staircase, left the hospital through the rear entrance and took a cab to the vicinity of 35th and Helstead, at which point the trail was lost. The abductor was described as 30 to 40 years old in 1964, of medium height and graying dark hair, brown eyes and a reddish complex. The police believed that she had a good idea of the hospital layout and staff routines. No trace of Paul or the woman was ever found. On July 2, 1965, a male toddler was found unattended outside a store in Newark, New Jersey. The child was named Scott McKinley by authorities while he was in foster care. Based on similarities in age and physical features, particularly ear shape, the possibility of McKinley being Franchak baby was raised. FBI agents tested Scott's blood and thought he might be Franchak's son, but since DNA testing was unavailable in 60s and Paul's footprints had not been taken before he was abducted, they were unable to establish the identity of the abandoned kid. Paul's parents believed that Scott was their son and legally adopted him when he was two years old. In 2012, at the age of 49, Paul Franchak decided to do a DNA testing to determine whether he was the real Paul. His parents weren't thrilled about the idea and wanted him to drop it, but eventually agreed. The DNA test proved he was not the biological son of Dora or Chester Franchak. The Franchaks are of Polish and Croatian descent and raised their children Roman Catholic. According to the genetic data, the man raised as Paul Franchak is of Jewish descent. Eventually, his real identity was confirmed. His birth name was Jack and he had a twin sister named Jill. His biological parents are deceased, but he has met his siblings and other relatives. The relatives say that both children mysteriously went missing shortly before their second birthdays. His biological parents told the father's side of the family that the twins were with mother's family and not to ask questions. Similarly, they told the mother's side of the family that the twins were with the father's family and also not to ask questions. The disappearance was never reported. Jill's whereabouts are still unknown. The Franchaks still do not know what happened to the real Paul Franchak. Hey guys, uh, before I go, just a quick announcement. I finally decided to open a Patreon account, so if you'd like to support me, now you have the option to do so. Since my content deals with topics which are considered non-advertiser friendly by YouTube, more than often my videos get demonetized. I have waited for YouTube to change things for almost a year now, but with the condition of YouTube right now, 
it feels like it may never change. I love making videos and will continue to do so. But if you have been enjoying my content and would like to support me, you can donate a small amount on Patreon every month which will greatly help me with paying for software subscription and stock footages. As of right now, the only reward I can provide is getting your name featured at the end of every video and having to suggest a topic for future videos. I will be adding more rewards in the future but as of now, those are the only perks. Nevertheless, whether you choose to support me by contributing or just by watching my videos, I truly thank you for all your continuous support.